ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. You might know the name Holly Valance from her time on Neighbours or her hit single, Kiss Kiss. Well, now she's in the headlines for supporting Donald Trump. In London last week, she held a ritzy function with her billionaire husband to raise money for the Trump campaign. And she's not the only one jumping on board. Since he was convicted of 34 felony charges, the former president has seen the cash flowing in. Today, Sarah Briner from Open Secrets, a non-profit group that tracks money in politics. I'm Sam Hawley on Gadigal Land in Sydney. This is ABC News Daily. Sarah, we know money means a lot in American election campaigns. I guess it's a case of you can never have too much of it. (laughs) Yeah. So one feature of U.S. politics is that unlike in most countries, elections can go on forever. So there's no truncated period in which candidates are allowed to run advertisements. There's the joke that's not really very funny, actually, that the next day of the first campaign is the day after the election. (laughs) So we live in this perma campaign. And that means that you just need a lot of money. Over time, we've entered a sort of money arms race where You never want to have less than you did before, and you never want to have less than the person you're running against. Right. Yeah. So money is really, really important. And of course, how much Donald Trump has compared to how much Joe Biden has matters as well. And since Donald Trump was convicted of 34 felony charges in the hush money case, of course, he's raised a lot more, hasn't he? He has. He claims it was his best day ever. (laughs) In the history of politics, I believe, maybe I'm wrong, somebody will find that I'm wrong, maybe, but I don't think so. They raised with small money donors a record $39 million in about a 10-hour period. We won't know that for sure for a few more weeks, but I have no reason to doubt the claim. I like those people. One interesting thing about Trump compared to other candidates is that some of the money he fundraises actually goes to pay for his legal bills. Uh So unlike a typical candidate, some of it we expect to go to pay for his lawyers. Yeah. All right. So in May, his campaign raised nearly $300 million, which was a huge amount. And that really closed the gap, didn't it, between how much he's got to spend and how much Joe Biden has got to spend. It does look like that is going to be the case. Yes. Biden had been doing pretty much consistently better than Trump up until May. Again, we don't know for sure until we see the reports, which are due in a couple weeks. But my assumption is that they're going to be pretty close. Yeah. It seems pretty incredible that he raises more money as a convicted criminal rather than less, doesn't it? (laughs) If you can't (laughs) laugh about it, we would all be crying. But yes, (laughs) it is uh, American democracy in a nutshell. Yes, Uh, Anybody can run for office. Well, let's have a look then, Sarah, at who actually is funding Trump, because by doing so, I assume you're really putting your name and, in a sense, your reputation behind him. I did note that even one of our own former Neighbours stars (laughs) and uh, pop star, Holly Valance, she's married to a billionaire in London and she's among his supporters and she is trying to raise money. For Donald Trump, she held a fundraiser dinner in London last week where Donald Trump's son, Donald Jr., was reportedly among the guests. So that sort of thing raises a lot of money, doesn't it? Yes, those big dollar fundraisers do. They tend to be pretty important. It's obviously, or maybe not obviously, illegal for foreign citizens to donate to U.S. political campaigns. But obviously there are lots of 
American citizens living abroad, many of whom are quite wealthy. And so getting those folks in a room to open up their pocketbooks can be pretty influential. Yeah, right. So she's married to a British property developer, Nick Candy. He's a He's a billionaire. Yeah. I mean, presumably if he's has British citizenship, he can't be giving money to US political activities. But that doesn't mean you can't hold a party and yeah. encourage your people with American citizenship to donate. Um, sure. That's completely fine. Absolutely. All right. And Holly Valance and her husband, they are also backers in the UK of Nigel Farage, just on, on the side. So that's, yep. that's one billionaire and his wife who are backing <laughs> Trump. So tell me, who are the others? So... These names are generally not household names to folks outside Mm -hmm. of maybe my household (laughs) and some of the people who look at this all the time. But the biggest supporters of Trump are and have been really ideological givers from the billionaire class. So Jeffrey Yass um, is a finance guy. Another one is this guy, Richard Uline, who owns a packaging company. But but generally speaking, these are not people who most of us have heard of. Right. That doesn't matter. You know, even if we don't know who they are, they still are affecting what we see when we look on YouTube, when we are, you know, scrolling through Facebook. Those ads are funded by these billionaires with a vested interest in the outcome of these races. Mm, and really interestingly, though, some of these billionaires have actually criticized Trump in the past, right? They've been really critical of his policies, but now they seem to have jumped back on board. Yeah. We have a two-party system, and it's really hard to not back one of those two party candidates because a lot of these people might not love Trump, but they cannot stomach the idea of having a Democrat in office. And that obviously is going to affect their their support. The last thing you want to do is be supporting the, the loser, especially with Trump being known for having a fairly vengeful streak. I think it's pretty transparent that he, that Trump rewards his friends and punishes his enemies. So if you're a Republican, it's sort of risky waters to be seen as an anti-Trumper. Yeah. All right. Well, that's the billionaires, of course. There's only a few of those, I suppose. Well, there's a fair few, but (laughs) we all wish we were one. Anyway, but really it's the smaller donors, right, that have traditionally really helped Trump. Just explain that for me. Yeah. So a small donor is somebody who gives less than $200 to the candidate. And they have traditionally supported Trump. I expect that a lot of that $300 million will be coming from people giving in those amounts. It's really hard to move the needle with $25 contributions. But it does say something about the national sentiment. It says something about likely voters. So small donors can matter, but they tend to be motivated by short-term events and very fickle. So what about then Joe Biden? Does he rely on these small donors or is it, you know, the bigger players that really help him out? Biden's fundraising actually doesn't look that different from Trump's in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. He gets about 30 percent of his money from small donors, which, again, is very significant when we're talking about the amount of money we're talking about. He has support, certainly, from billionaires and millionaires. He also gets a lot of support from trade unions as well as what we might think of as sort of the intellectual class. So university professors, teachers, teachers unions, it certainly is a lot of money and it adds up really fast. For Biden, I think we're talking in the order of 300 million through April. You know, by this point, we probably are reaching a billion or close to a billion for both of the candidates in total. Sarah, let's have a look then at the rules around all of this. There is concern, isn't there, about anonymous donations from what's known as super PACs. Yeah. So just explain, what are they? A super PAC is a political committee that can support a candidate. It can run advertisements and it can also take money from essentially anything, a corporation, a person, a union, and take that money to run those supportive advertisements or advertisements sort of calling your opponent a criminal and so on. <laughs> and they they are not restricted in how much money they can take or really for from whom they can take it. The dark money starts to come into the system when those super PACs, which do have to tell the public who their donors are, but they tell the public that their donor is 
sort of an unknowable thing. So a common example would be something like, I got a million dollars from ABC LLC, and I spent that money to support Joe Biden. Nobody knows who that donor was. And I think it's hugely problematic when, you know, we might not know who those donors are, but the super PAC does. Mm. <laughs> and if the super PAC does, ultimately the policymaker might. And are they gonna be beholden to the citizens or to their financial backers? I think we all know the answer. Right. Okay. So that then comes to if they're elected, <laughs> what they do in government, and we don't know at that point who's been funding them. Absolutely. So, Sarah, as we mentioned, the fundraising gap between the two has now really tightened. So let's look at why that matters. Is it necessarily the case that the richest candidate wins? What do we know from history? I think around 90% of the time, the better funded candidate wins. Mm, wow. But there are some very high profile exceptions. Mm. <laughs> and the highest profile was the Trump Clinton campaign in 2016, where Clinton absolutely washed the floor with Trump. <laughs> so she completely demolished him in fundraising and obviously famously lost. So I think that what actually that example shows well is that money can oftentimes indicate that you have support from voters, especially if it's coming from small donors or from mm -hmm. sort of regular people. One billionaire can give, you know, a million dollars, but they're still only one voter. But, you know, it's not necessarily going to change anyone's mind. You can't spend and spend and spend and necessarily change the outcome. If that were the case, we would have President Michael Bloomberg right now. Uh -huh. He famously spent a billion dollars of his own money in March of 2020. And he got one electoral vote. Oh <laughs> it doesn't buy the outcome, but it can say a lot about your viability and can get your candidate more people out to the polls on election day. Mm. All right. Well, Sarah, what do you think? Would the Biden camp be worried at this point that Trump is catching up in fundraising? And I'm guessing, as you said, they might be because it is a sign of support for him. I would be astonished if behind closed doors they weren't fretting mm. about where the campaigns are looking right now. For Trump to now be doing well is a problem for the Democrats. There's a while to go, of course, before November. And what do you think, Sarah, about the way money is thrown around during these election campaigns? I mean, it's just massive, isn't it? It is. And who's the loser in all of this? It's, you know, people like you and me. <laughs> you live in Australia, so not so much you, but in, to some extent, yes, also anyone in the world, because the U.S. elections are consequential everywhere. Yes. But we don't know who's funding a lot of the media we consume. We don't know what their motivations are. And we don't even know, in many cases, whether what they're saying is truthful. I think that this is a game for the rich. And in the end, it does not do American democracy any favors to see the total's just getting higher and higher and higher. Sarah Briner is the Director of Research and Strategy at Open Secrets, which tracks money in politics in the United States. This episode was produced by Jess O'Callaghan, Bridget Fitzgerald, audio production by Sam Dunn. Our supervising producer is David Cody. I'm Sam Hawley. ABC News Daily will be back again tomorrow. Thanks for listening. <laughs>